50 years ago, a message sent from one computer to another began something called ARPANET. Building on that, 20 years later, Tim Berners-Lee wrote the code that helped launch the Internet. Who then would have predicted what it's become today or where it's all headed next? With us to analyze the past and imagine the future, on the line from Burbank, California, there's Cory Doctorow, writer, activist, and co-editor of the group blog Boing Boing. In Courtney, British Columbia, on Vancouver Island via Skype, Jacob Malthouse, co-founder of the Dot Eco domain and one of the people behind the Save.org campaign. And here in our studio, Ramona Pringle, director of the Creative Innovation Studio and an associate professor in the Faculty of Communication and Design at Ryerson University, and it is great to have you three on TVO tonight. Ramona, it's been ages. Good to have you it's back here. It's great to here. be here. Thank you. Corey, nice to see you again. Jacob as well, out on the left coast. Let us, as long as Corey's on the program, why don't we have some fun here off the top? Because we were talking about how young the Internet was back in January of 1996 in this very studio. And, uh, Sheldon, shall we roll a clip and see if anybody recognizes anybody in this clip? Fire away. I think the web represents an explosion truly from the grassroots that none of us quite anticipated happening so quickly, that just exploded from everywhere. This is the thing you hear about it, is that this thing is, is you know, anarchic, mm -hmm. unregulated, totally democratic. Unregulatable. Unregulatable. It's uh, technologically infeasible to do something as basic as determine how many computers are connected to the internet. Uh, in a situation like that, it becomes very difficult to block access from or to a specific a government's computer. nightmare then, right? Uh, it can't control it. Yeah, if you want to take that sort of, if if, if in in if this were if this were a movie starring Sl Sylvester Stallone, the internet would be the means by which the underground threw off the yoke of their oppressors. <laughs> you know, it, it 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 is in some senses a, an anarchic environment in which it is very difficult to keep track of who does what and when and how. Well, the first person we heard from in that clip was Bill Washburn of Meckler Media, but I think the other guy sure looked a lot like what Cory Doctorow might have looked like when he was about 12 years old. Um, Corey, how much do you agree with your former self? You know, I would, I would, uh, in the spirit of, uh, the creative arts here, I would give my, my former self a yes and, and <laughs> that and would be that in addition to being the means by which people organize movements for liberation, it's also the means by which those they organize against create the counter revolution. Um, and, and I think... I'd like to think that back then I was cognizant of that too. I mean, people don't get worked up about the future of the internet if they think it's just going to automatically be great. So uh, I, I think that there were many of us who were both excited about the possible future, but also terrified about how it could go wrong. Right. Prescient for 24 years ago, I'd say. Ramona, how about uh, some of the adjectives we heard? Anarchic, democratic, and unregulatable. I mean, what do you say? certainly watching it, it feels like my how times change and how we learn and hindsight is 2020. Mm -hmm. You think about those early days and everyone sort of scrambling to get uh, the domains as if it was, um, you know, as if it was actual real estate and they were the ones who were hoping to get rich and not all of them did get rich in the end. But even just sort of looking back at this now, there's this idea of, you know, you talk about the, the yes and and the creative mind, uh, that the creatives move into the, the new neighborhood, the derelict neighborhood, and then everyone follows who wants to make a buck. And I think that that's what we've seen with the internet is there was that sort of hopeful, um, uh, that hopeful utopian vision of what it could be. And of course, once something becomes hot, once it's been made uh, a space that everyone else wants to clamor to, those who, who want to cash in on it will, and, uh, and the rest follows as we've seen. Well, Jacob, in which case, how naive do you think the creators of the internet were back in the day? Well, it's a great question. For me, I think a lot of this has sort of almost religious undertones. You know, when you hear people talking, the passion with which they're talking, that it's a new movement, that there's anarchy, that there's opportunity, that there's freedom for everybody. Um, and now I, I think what you're seeing is that there's been so much money just dumped into the system. It's become like an accelerant. And you know, the thing that comes to mind to me is like the Catholic Church and when the Catholic Church just became kind of like Fat Elvis and the whole thing started to lose touch with its roots. And now we have essentially a Protestant movement saying we need to return back to these principles 
on which the internet was founded and what it was kind of meant to be, because what we see right now bears no real relation to those founding principles. And that's a danger for the internet going forward because it needs those principles to work well. I should ask Corey then, do you think there actually was a time when the internet resembled the kind of naive and charming aspirations that the you know, original users had in mind? Yeah, I think that was actually the situation that obtained until pretty recently, and that there are still lots of pockets of it. But, you know, the the transformation of the web especially, but the internet more broadly, from a place with low barriers to entry and lots of little niches where people could just pop up and, and try their own thing, and it was all rough-hewn and, and very homespun and charming, to just like five giant websites filled with screenshots from the other four, that was, uh, I, I don't think it was an accident. I think that, you know, we undertook a bunch of policies that, whose de facto outcome was to encourage market concentration and not just in the internet. You know, I'm sitting here wearing glasses. My glasses along with your glasses and basically every other pair of glasses you've seen in the last five years are made by companies owned by one company called Luxottica that bought them all with, with private equity money, along with every major eyewear retailer and the largest eyewear insurer and the largest eyewear uh, lens sure. manufacturer. You know, pro wrestling is down from 30 leagues to one league. Automotive is down from dozens of companies to three. I mean, this is the trend around all industries. And I think that it's, although tech has had a role in that, I think um, it's a form of tech exceptionalism to say that the way that we got to this concentrated kind of plutocratic moment was because of the web and not that the web is yet another casualty of our concentrated plutocratic moment. Ramona, you wanted to add? Uh, I, I would, I mean, I'm boring response, but I, I, would, I would be totally in agreement. You're in screaming agreement here. In screaming agreement. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I, um, you know, I, my interest in tech in the digital world very much came from a place of possibility and utopian and this belief that fundamentally as humans we want uh, that we're very creative and that we want to be part of a collective and that the web was this space that enabled all of those things. And to this day, still, you know, you can learn how to fix a cabinet. You can learn how to make your Ikea furniture into anything other than what it was supposed to be. You can learn how to, uh, you know, decorate anything from cookies to your home, there's so many opportunities to learn and to be creative and to, and to gather. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the, the, those initial promises are still there, but there is this, uh, the, there are these uh, gates, you know, mm. these sort of gated communities of, you know, the big tech companies that have arisen and make a lot of money in the process. And I think that's where a lot of the, the, the concern has arisen. Well, I wonder whether, uh, I wonder how many people out there thought that maybe uh, overthrowing oppressive governments might also be on the list of mm -hmm. possibilities for the internet. And to that end, I want to read something here that Jesse Hempel has written in Wired magazine, which of course covers this landscape. And uh, here's what she wrote, and then we'll come back and chat. Meanwhile, militants have harnessed the same technology to organize attacks and recruit converts, catapulting the world into instability. Instead of new robust democracies, we have a global challenge with no obvious solution. The Arab Spring, carried the promise that social media and the internet were going to unleash a new wave of positive social change. But liberty isn't the only end toward which these tools can be turned. Can I get you on that, Jacob? How disappointing for you that that that, that aspect of the internet's possibilities have really not transpired maybe as much as many people had hoped. Yeah, I mean, look, if you're growing up in Southern California and Silicon Valley and there's rule of law and there's a justice system and there's, you know, generally things are well run and there's water and sewer and all those great things, then we don't really think. I think a lot of the people that created the Internet weren't even really thinking about, you know, what the Internet could do in places where there are none of those things. Right. And. You know, the Internet is a tool. You, you know, you said that, and I think it's a really good point. You know, a hammer can be used to build a house or it can be used to bludgeon someone to death. And so what we're seeing here is a tool being applied in dramatically different ways by different people to achieve their own ends, whether that's terrorist groups or, uh, you know, totalitarian states or, you know, people doing tremendous good in the world. Corey, how close to those ideals and aspirations do you think the Internet has enabled people to become? Well, 
I th I think that what the internet is really good for, uh, both for commercial entities and for political movements, good and bad, is finding people. Right. The reason advertisers like the internet is because if you want to like sell a refrigerator. That's a really hard thing to do because the median person buys like one or fewer refrigerators in their life. And so anything that can help you target someone who might be buying a refrigerator, like a history of searching for kitchen renos, that's a, that's a, a godsend for you. By the same token, if you think Black Lives Matter, it's a way to find other people who think Black Lives Matter. If you think non-binary gender, gender identities are, are meaningful, it's a way to help you find those. And if you're a Nazi who wants to march through Charlottesville with a tiki torch, it helps you find those. Hmm. And so I think the question we need to ask when we say, well, there's militant movements and there's antisocial movements and conspiratorial movements connecting through the internet, is why is it that so many people find militant, antisocial, conspiratorial beliefs so easy to believe in. And that takes me just back to oligarchy, right? Like if you scratch an anti-vaxxer, you'll find someone who knows an awful lot about things like the opioid epidemic and the role of people like the Sacklers in engineering it with complicity from their regulators. Like I think the rise in conspiratorial belief is the intersection of a rise of actual conspiracies, right? Rich people getting together to conspire to screw the rest of us over by sowing doubt about climate or you know, covering up their uh, aviation problems with the Boeing 737 or whatnot, and the ability of the internet to find people for whom the terror of knowing that you live in a world where the things that we assume to be bedrocks, like that our planes won't fall out of the sky because they're well regulated, makes them susceptible to other conspiratorial explanations for other things. And yeah, if they couldn't find each other, it would slow down the contagion. But the susceptibility, I think, is the outflow of a general breakdown in the institutions that we used to create like legitimate truthful bases to proceed, whether that's in medicine or aviation or any other field. Hmm. Ramona, let me ask you about the surveillance state. Let's talk Hong Kong, for example. How much, you know, this is in, in, in some respects a game of whack-a-mole, right? Mm -hmm. The um, protesters try to use social media to gain an advantage mm -hmm. on their oppressors, and their oppressors, of course, try to use the surveillance state to stay one step ahead of them. How's that cat and mouse game working? Well, I mean, and back to your, your previous question about sort of using these tools as a means of rebellion, mm -hmm. it's not just the freedom fighters who are using these tools. And with every year that passes, government uses them. There's a, there, there's a report that comes out uh, there was a report from an organization called Freedom House. It's mm -hmm. a think tank in the U.S. And they said that Internet freedoms have declined steadily year after year for the past eight years. They point the finger at China. And that's what we see right now is this country where the, they're extremely digitally savvy protesters where, you know, a lot of what they're doing is actually analog measures of not being traced. Because when we talk about the internet, this isn't just what you're searching for and the people you're trying to connect to, but this is how everything is connected down to your transit cards. So not using, you know, paying cash for uh, to use transit so that that piece of their behavior, their location in the city, in the world, away from a screen is not being traced. Hmm. Uh, all of this stemming to the fact that in China, the, the surveillance state is so complete. There's the, the notion of the social credit score where whether it's what you buy, whether it's you know dropping your gum wrapper on the floor or maybe helping someone with a lost wallet, your score is going up or going down. But there's been cases of this having an impact on whether or not people can get into college, whether they're allowed to buy uh, an airplane ticket. And so you've got um, this level of digital savvy on both sides that, as you say, it does become a, a, a game of whack-a-mole as both sides try to outsmart the other. And now what we're seeing, it's, it's not a matter of even using digital savvy or using digital tools to outsmart the other side. Sometimes it's a matter of stripping back and understanding that because the digital web touches us not just on this web, this screen that we log into either you know in the palm of our hands or on a desk somewhere, but everywhere through throughout our lives, that everything is connected and networked, and certainly this you know, gleaming 5G uh, future that we're promised only leads us further down that path. Um, but sometimes now, you know, here we are on the cusp of 2020, the best measures uh, protesters can take is to pull back from that watchful mm. eye. Well, before we get to that gleaming 5G future, I want to talk a bit about the toxicity, the toxic stew that so many of us find ourselves in on a daily basis here. I suspect many of the people watching this program right now will have heard of characters by the name of Borat or Ali G. Uh, these are, of course, out of the very brilliant mind of a comedian named Sasha Baron Cohen. And um, I don't know if you, well, I was going to say, uh, 1.4 million people have gone onto YouTube and watched this guy give a half-hour speech 
where he's not making any jokes at all. He's being dead serious about um, the state of things and where the Internet has taken us. Let's play a little snippet from that speech, and then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, if you would. Conspiracy theories once confined to the fringe are going mainstream. It's as if the age of reason, the era of evidential argument, is ending. And now knowledge is increasingly delegitimized and scientific consensus is dismissed. Democracy, which depends on shared truths, is in retreat. And autocracy, which depends on shared lies, is on the march. All this hate and violence is being facilitated by a handful of internet companies that amount to the greatest propaganda machine in history. This can't possibly be what the creators of the internet had in mind. I believe that it's time for a fundamental rethink of social media and how it spreads hate, conspiracies, and lies. That is pretty intense stuff, and let's get into that. Jacob, uh, are you with him or again him on that? Yeah, I think he's totally right. And one of the things that's happened kind of slowly, like a boiling frog, is that the internet has become pay to play. So these big companies are still entirely dependent on advertising for their primary revenue stream, and they need to show quarterly results to increase that revenue revenue stream. So there's churn, they need that churn, they are really dependent on a single point of revenue. And if you look at the above the fold on Google, you know, six years ago, there were still unpaid search results on it. But you go any valuable place on the internet right now and it's all paid. So you effectively have a two tier internet that's been created. And I think it's hugely problematic for people who have, uh, you know, less money to pay to get their views up to the top of the pecking order. Corey, he called it the biggest propaganda machine of all time. Is he right? Well, I think he's right in, in diagnosing that there's a problem. And I, I think, you know, you can spot the problem from orbit. But I think when you actually dig into the nuance of what he says, there's a lot that's pretty troubling in there. Like, part of his remedy is that you could ask the, um, the Anti-Defamation League to uh, tell you what is and isn't hate speech. He says, hate speech isn't hard to classify. The ADL could tell you what it is. Well, I'm a Jew, and I believe in the boycott, divest, and sanctions movement, and the ADL calls that hate speech. So the idea that we would take a legitimate form of political disagreement, one that in fact has a number of proponents in Israel, including major opposition parties, and say that those words may no longer be uttered on the internet because we found the NGO that we trust to be the arbiter of, of, of good and bad speech, I think is not just reductionist, I think it's, it's actually ridiculous. Um, you know, I, I think that what he's talking about fundamentally is the creation of kind of state regulated monopolies that that the way to secure facebook is to make facebook kind of the eternal ruler of our online social spaces but then demand that it kind of suffer itself to be draped in golden chains uh limiting its conduct you know insisting that it buy in huge boiler rooms full of moderators that would somehow know what was and wasn't hate speech and the reason that facebook can't address harassment isn't merely because the ordinary mediocrities who run that company are not suitable to decide what is and isn't viable for people to say and think for 2.5 billion people in 150 countries around the world. It's because no one is, right? There, there isn't the one group or the group of groups or the council of groups that we could convene that would be able to make those calls well. Um, those are hard for judges to make. They're going to be very, very hard for corporations to make. I think if we want to make Facebook's dumb mistakes less consequential, we have to make Facebook less consequential. We have to make it possible for people to be in the discourse without having to, you know, make themselves subject to Mark Zuckerberg's jurisdiction because, you know, he's not going to get it right, nor will any of his successors, nor will any of his competitors. Well, Ramona, let me try this. Sasha Baron Cohen does go on in the speech to say things like, if you tried to get away in the quote unquote legacy press, or let's dare I call mm -hmm. it legitimate press or something like that, if you tried to get away with saying some of the stuff that we see on Facebook, you'd be sued, there'd be a court process, there's a whole, there's a whole process for that. On Facebook, it's a wild west. You can do whatever mm -hmm. you want, whenever you want, and, and damn the torpedoes. And obviously, he'd like to see something done about that. Where are you on that? You know, I think we, it, here, here it is, we're talking about 30 years at the, you know, being generous in mm -hmm. terms of how long this, the internet's been around. And yet we, 
talk about it as being new, as if it's, as you say, the Wild West all the time. Everything else that we interface with it are in our lives, whether it's the food that we eat or you know, kids programming on television, cars and car safety, everything faces some kind of regulation, some kind of external third party uh, that's checks and balances. And what we see with these companies is that they can, um, you know, set their own rules, they can set their own measures. A great example is when we talk about fast food on a platform like let's say uh, YouTube and kids programming where they may say, oh, we don't have any ads, just like with you know, TVO or PBS, you wouldn't have ads for fast food with kids programming. Uh, and yet, you know, you could have a, a, an entire programmed channel, an entire that is from a fast food company. And so, there's a lot of cracks that you know things can slip through a lot of cracks when the companies are the only ones holding themselves accountable. Now, granted, it's very challenging when it comes to things like hate speech, how you uphold, uh, you know, what those rules are and how they're upheld, and who's making the decisions and who is the arbiter of what is good or not good. These are really challenging issues. And I know for these major companies, they don't. It's a slippery slope for them. Once they start deciding that fine line of, of sort of good, not good, allowed, not allowed. But in the bigger picture, there's a lot of issues that we're dealing with now. And I think because it's always been seen as, oh, you know, the argument's always been it's an impediment to innovation when there's when there's regulation, when there's rules. But those rules, instead of thinking about rules, which, you know, nobody likes rules, instead we need to be thinking about what's best for our communities, what's best for us, what's best for humans, how do we keep each other happy, healthy, safe within the context of this space where we spend a lot of our mm. lives. Happy, healthy, uh, et cetera, but Jacob, I, you know, one wonders whether or not the internet needs something like, and this will be a terrible example, but I'll throw it out there for lack of a better idea, a kind of a United Nations of the internet, where you know some major international organization uh, is responsible for figuring this stuff out. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, there are a constellation of organizations that work on this stuff. I can, where I used to work, and a bunch of others that are involved in internet governance. I think we desperately need nonprofits and citizens to step up and start showing up at those forums. But look, getting back to what Corey was saying earlier, I think we've been through this before. The last major human revolution was the energy revolution, and it created oligarchs like Standard Oil and the Rockefellers and the Carnegies. And these people, uh, had a tremendous amount of power and a tremendous amount of money in a very short period of time. And they weren't necessarily intending things to be bad. They were delivering light and gasoline and railroads. But what happened was they just accumulated so much power so fast that the whole system got out of whack. And the response was people like Roosevelt and unionization and regula regulation, like the EPA got created because rivers started catching on fire. And people were like, what the hell is going on with rivers catching on fire? We need an EPA. And I feel like that's where we're at right now. You know, we're at a point where we're like, as Ramona said, the public interest here has to play a role in how these companies are operating. And maybe it's not the United Nations, but I think it's multiple planks of engagement consistently to try and figure out how to solve this problem. We need to step up and save the internet. Well, uh, Corey, I suspect Ramona's right in as much as th there's something about making rules over something that we've just enjoyed using any way we want for the last many decades uh, that kind of rubs us the wrong way. Hmm. But, but do you think something's gotta be done? I know we talked 24 years ago in this studio about this thing being unregulatable, but is it time for some kind of regulatory authority to bring its wisdom to bear here? Yeah, I'm actually all for uh, some regulatory interventions here. Like, you know, I would be, I would fully support rules that required Facebook and the other big tech platforms to uh, allow competitors, whether they be nonprofit, for profit, state or private, to interoperate with them so that users wouldn't be stuck in a walled garden. I'd also like to see just the traditional contours of antitrust applied. You know, we talk about Facebook and the other companies as though they had grown through network effects or first mover advantages. When you look closely, mostly what they did was just bought all their competitors, which is something that was illegal until the Reagan and Thatcher years. You know, Google's a company that's only made yeah. one and a half successful products, right? They made a great search engine and a pretty good Hotmail clone. Everything else is something that they bought and everything they did in-house like Sidewalk Labs has been a flop. Well, yeah. the, ju the jury's still the out on Sidewalk. 
Sorry, I was just going to say that the, the jury's still out on sidewalk labs. Let's well, see. Well, they haven't that. done anything yet. All they've all they've yeah. done is lie about how big their their surveillance city is going to be. Oh my God, you're going to get us sued here, Corey. <laughs> Come on, be careful here. Uh, you know what? Um, where do I want Corey? You did use an expression in in a in a piece not too long ago. Uh, did, have I got this right? A Zucker vegan? What is a Zucker vegan? Yeah, I'm a Zucker vegan. I I don't use any Facebook products. I don't use Facebook, WhatsApp, or or Instagram. Uh, you know, I block them in my, uh, on my computer and so on. Um, but it's a hard thing to do. You know, the, the place where network effects actually do matter is when the people that you want to communicate with are there, right? If, you, if you're an activist, it's very hard not to be on Facebook because many of the people you want to communicate with are there and so on. The problem is that um, when you put yourself under the power of a, an unaccountable, high-handed entity like Facebook, you put yourself at their mercy, right? You, they, Facebook giveth and Facebook taketh away. So in the last few years, you know, the last year especially, there's been a lot of far-right figures uh, clutching their pearls about, about uh, Alex Jones and other far-right figures being kicked off the platforms. But for, you know, 10 years before that, there were a lot of people from the progressive side worried about the trans activists being kicked off the platforms and activists for sex workers' rights being kicked off the platforms, anti-pipeline activists, and so on. The deplatforming has been going on for a long time, uh, and they only just now got to the Nazis, but they've been doing it to everybody else for, for a very long time indeed. And so when you make yourself beholden to these large firms that, uh, you know, they rather than having a system of justice, they have these like sprawling garbage novellas of terms of service that are backed up by secret three ring binders full of, you know, moderation codes enforced by boiler rooms full of, you know, minimum wage employees in the Pacific Rim. You are taking yourself out of the public realm and putting yourself in the hands of a dictator whose benevolence you absolutely can't rely upon. Ramona, is it even remotely possible nowadays to lead and define this how you will? a normal life if you want to be a Zucker vegan? You know, it's a great question. I think people are making decisions for themselves about how they want to spend their time, spend their attention, and I think that's a big piece of all of this. Uh, granted, I think it's where I lean towards regulation a little bit as well. I think quite often people are told, oh, if you don't like this, leave the platform, and the pressure gets put on the individual. And I think as individuals, we do have a lot of power in terms of where we put our eyeballs and where we click and where we put our attention. Uh, but I think that the, the sort of bigger decisions, the bigger forces that be, the decision shouldn't just sit on the, the shoulders of individuals. It's got to sit with these major companies. There's got to be government involvement in all of this as well. It is really challenging. I mean, you know, I deal with students on a daily basis and startups on a creative startups on a daily basis. And when they are trying to get out into the world, they rely on the platforms by which they can reach audiences, users, communities, employers. Uh, of course, the challenge with a lot of these platforms, again, is they're so opaque. There's so little transparency in terms of algorithms and then when the algorithm changes and why the algorithm changes and what happens afterwards that they may develop uh, you know, um, a rabid, robust, enthusiastic audience and then not be able to reach them without paying thousands of dollars. And so it's really challenging. Uh, and and uh, so... I mean, what is a normal life anyway? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that is a good question. Although I just read the piece that you wrote. I forget who you wrote it for, but I read the piece which, in which you suggested, I guess it was for the CBC website, that, um, you know, we keep t treating the Internet as if it's some kind of mm -hmm. petulant teenager, when in fact it's, I mean, it's not quite middle-aged, but, you know, Jacob, the Internet is 30 years old now. And, and, I mean, is it time to grow up and move out of their parents' basement and be a little bit more mature about things? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a bit of a quarter life crisis going on. I mean, you can use so many analogies to talk about the internet. The one I really like is that we've gotten to this point here where we need to evaluate what impact it is having on society. It's no longer a novelty, but it is directly impacting how we function. And so governments and citizens need to start paying attention to the public interest much more directly. We cannot just leave it to companies as Corey said, the concentration of wealth has been so dramatic. I mean, I cannot believe that in eight weeks, people raised a billion dollars to buy the .org domain without telling anyone. There's just so much cash. Well, hold your sign up. It around. Go ahead, hold your sign up. Hold my sign up, <laughs> save.org. Yeah, tell, what's right. that all about? Where is that? Save.org, .org. There's almost 15,000 people have signed up to stop .org being sold to a private equity firm that we know nothing about. And there's millions of nonprofits who are, you know, using .org for 20 years. 
and can't move off that platform. Think about 350.org, EFF.org, you know, and now we just have no idea who's going to be in charge of that domain. And for me, this is like just a massive moment where I just felt like, you know, Martin Luther or something. I want to go nail something to a door and be like, what the heck <laughs> is going on at the church, you know, that we're doing this kind of stuff, especially now. Well, Don't forget TVO.org. Oh, Corey, God bless you. I was just going to say, in the interest of full disclosure, yeah, we're a .org organization as well. Um, right. Corey, I got about a minute and a half left. Do you want to tell me, Corey, whether you think uh, Jacob is onto something here with this save.org? Is this an important principle at stake here? Oh, I think it's it's absolutely bedrock. I think it's it's critical. I think that we're we're um, at a crossroads now where the internet has become kind of the nervous system of the 21st century. And our problem with regulating it is that, you know, there are people who come at it and say, well, how do we make sure that it's safe as an entertainment medium? And others who say, how do we make safe that it make sure that it's safe as a public square? And and we have to make it safe for all the things that we're doing with it. It's it's where we find romance and education and employment and all the other elements of our lives. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't regulate it, but it means that we should regulate with gravitas and care and not say, well, so long as people aren't watching TV the wrong way on the internet, job our job is done, even if that makes it hard to do, say, civic engagement. Uh, we have to do all of the things. Gravitas and care. That is a lovely place to leave this. That's Corey Doctorow, who joined us from Burbank, California tonight. Boing Boing is his site. Uh, go there and check that out. Jacob Malthouse joined us from Courtney, British Columbia. He's the founder. As the sign indicated, there it is again, save.org. <laughs> and Ramona Pringle comes to us today from Ryerson University, and we're delighted to see you again here in our studio. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thanks so much, everybody. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.